broadly i want to speak about uh, the economy emissions energy uh, and the earth system now in the first two things uh, ethics politics class inequity matter for the earth system it matters indirectly it doesn't matter where your emissions come from and who's causing it or why the earth reacts or does not react in certain ways uh, whereas in the first two things obviously its politics and equity issues are key uh, so in a very broad context uh, sort of global warming one core is a system that constantly expands this is annual gdp over 200 years uh, in in 1990 dollars so 49 billion is not what it is now it is 49 trillion rather in 1990 dollars and this is what it was in 1820 uh, it is in i think 700 times and each year and for every 1% rise in gdp roughly we have a 0.4 to 0.5% rise in uh, emissions uh, and if you look at if one wants to understand where we are with emissions and if one understand where we are going there are sort of three processes that one needs to understand over roughly the lab and there are many other important processes i merely identify three partly for want of time and uh, this uh, both urbanization and increasing inequ- inequality have been key the spread of sort of a very chaotic urbanization in peri urban areas and different parts including in india but also uh, sort of inequalities both of income and of wealth and particularly with the better off is not just what they spend in terms of their income and emissions but also in terms of embodied emissions because of the wealth they either acquire or the other what they have uh, and this photograph actually captures both processes quite well this is a photo taken by a drone uh, it's a photo from over bombay and the one side on the left you can see uh, the bastis what in bombay are called jhopad patties and the right you can see a fairly plush colony you know with greenery and so on and much more space and this is a third um, element in a sense of the process which is a spreading capitalism which over the last 30 or 35 years has spread to russia china in china there are many theoretical frameworks about what how one can characterize it maybe it's state capitalism maybe it's state socialism there certainly is a far higher has a proportion in aspect of state control in china than there is in most other large economies uh, however uh, there's no doubt that there's been a spread in many other places as well and a deepening in a number of countries Uh, including in india now all these three are structural factors they are not random and these structural factors persist and so they therefore influence how we go forward with uh, emissions uh, now this as a consequence of these three uh, in the last 30 years what we've seen is a massive rise in carbon emissions uh, but also because of the growth that i pointed out earlier in an ever expanding system and ever expanding resource use ever expanding material use every rise is larger and so as a consequence half of all the carbon dioxide emissions since 1750 have occurred in the last 30 years or so and also the rise as we can see from 23 to 37 billion dollars now the point of where the earth system comes in is that the according to the ipcc so even if we cut by more than half from the present what happens is that the processes by which carbon dioxide are taken and absorbed into the earth system are slow and they are a combination of chemical processes biogeochemical processes and the ocean system and so that's a very slow process and as a consequence the ipcc argues that even if we cut carbon dioxide annual levels from 37 presently to less half uh, about 16 roughly basically co2 levels in the atmosphere which is essentially what causes warming will sort of stabilize for a decade and then rise slowly which is not to say that cuts are not important they are crucial because the rate of growth will slow down but this is what how the earth will respond and that's why i was talking earlier of the earth system responding now just to look at some other key countries <clears throat> the united states uh, its carbon dioxide emissions fell from about roughly 6 billion tons in 2005 which was its peak which is why the us pushes or rather when it was part of the nego paris agreement and so on it pushes for 2005 as a new baseline unlike 1992 because that was its peak in terms of its emissions to about 5.1 billion tons currently and uh, in 2017 which is the latest year for which reliable data is available from edgar and we know about the expansion of shale in the us in recent years 
but also there was energy efficiency in a third factor which is also a decline in incomes of a very large wide range of people so we had essentially a greater inequality and as a consequence a lot of people were being forced to spend less and consequence so there were these three factors however this decline in co2 emissions doesn't include the rise in methane emissions which come from fugitive emissions which come from shale which comes from a range of factors which I'll also touch upon later which are rising so if you look at not just co2 but look at it overall in greenhouse gases the us decline is not as much as they might talk about or others might if you look at it overall including gsp now china is the key china is way above the highest emitter in the world and again the key drivers of china's rise has to do with the spread of capital as i said earlier as a lot of manufacturing either left or expanded there over the last particularly since the 1990s it was a very strongly state led development with the chinese state going to villages and actively getting workers into their factories at the same time older workers in large factories were asked to leave given vrs dismissed etc factories closed down so there's a combined process of in your care that's too much detail but the point is this that b- what happened as a consequence of this process is that by about by 2015 china was making about 80% of the world's air conditioners 70% of the world's mobile phones 60% of the world's shoes and overall a quarter of all the goods produced worldwide by 2015 accompanying that process of increased manufacturing was a massive investment in infrastructure it was huge and urbanization and reflected in this data which still st- when i came across this bit of fact or factoid a few weeks ago and i still can't believe it and i've double checked it and i triple checked it but i still can't, anyhow okay this is what it says backlaps mill is a highly renowned energy expert and he argues that in 3 years china used up more concrete than the us did in the entire 20th century which reflects its emissions now however whereas china is by overwhelming the world's largest co2 emitter if you look at it per capita terms it becomes a little different i notice where india is and now the reason i'm mentioning this is that a lot of people do talk of per capita rightly so but i'm going to argue that we need to maybe perhaps distinguish if you're talking only of per capita distinguish somewhat between india and china look at china's per capita much lower than the us However, it's actually higher than the European Union. So, effectively, if the U.S. were to cut, let's say hypothetically, the U.S. were to cut its emissions even by half, per capita, it would still be higher than the EU, which one would plausibly argue is a reasonable level of lifestyle, right? Though EU, of course, when I'm talking of per capita, I'm very conscious of the fact that I that there's also very deep inequalities within societies. So, when I talk of per capita India or per capita even within the EU, this masks the fact that there are very deep and structural inequalities within, right? but one is that the us can very clearly decline secondly is the fact that china is actually higher than the eu so that's a slight word of caution on the way the other part is of course looking at it cumulatively and there too again one looks at how high the us is uh there too china is non trivial i mean it's about still half of the us but it's a non trivial even historically this is overall historical and not uh, per capita historical but it's still quite large This third data is from a different data set and it's slightly different so it's actually South Asia not India West Europe and not just EU but again one looks at the huge in terms of consumption that is to say not just where it's being produced but actually where goods are then imported so it looks in terms of trade and China therefore is significantly less than both the EU and at least Western Europe and the United States of course one could make the point as Raghu briefly did uh, some months ago where not with standing consumption data china has generates employment in china no doubt but however the consumption difference is quite stark um uh, here again i just want to emphasize the point about us looking at uh, india and china uh, a bit differently there's a tendency to club them together both in uh, you know people's writing and at the formal political level and basic and various other Uh, but uh, i would argue that there's at least some of these numbers suggest that one needs to sort of like maybe look at them a little differently okay now we shift to a second part which is these key impacts uh, this is probably well known to most of you about extreme events uh, getting more widespread and frequent <clears throat> extreme heat which used to be 0.1% roughly of the earth's land mass in 1950s has actually spread to 10% of the earth's land mass currently and is causing uh, deaths in india pakistan a range of other places besides warming the planet is melting there have been three landmark reports recently one from isimod about the himalayan ecosystem 
one which looked at the uh, antarctic and rather the uh, cryosphere and the oceans which talked of glaciers melting worldwide except to partly in the karakoram and a third one looked at what's happening in the arctic and this remember the arctic is not just ice it also is 4 million people but besides these three uh, which is why many activists have stopped talking of that using the term climate change but use the term climate crisis also complete chaos in the natural world and uh, it is so extensive that i often say that it's far worse than what impact in human beings are facing and these are not just the geographical shifts in range that uh, the area where species live but also uh, changes in the timing of life cycle events my point is that it's causing havoc in ecosystems in different ways that we i think don't uh, sort of yeah now so this kind of reasons for urgency we know about the ipcc report last year but also the fact that key ecosystems are on basically changing and they're changing the threshold in ways that once they cross a tipping point they will not recover and this includes the arctic and possibly the west Ant- west antarctic ice sheet but the key point is that what differentiates the about a climate crisis from many other crises not all but many is that of the climate crisis there are windows closing we can deal with the delhi pollution level hopefully now or next year we can also deal with it 20 years later we can't deal with the arctic in that fashion we can't deal with the west west antarctic ice ice sheet in that fashion if the west antarctic ice sheet goes it's gone it's gone forever and it will lead to several meters of sea level rise the arctic is similar essentially it's in this and this differentiate the climate crisis from many other issues and also because there are feedback loops where one part of the earth system say the arctic is less ice and absorbing more heat affects other parts and it affects other systems as well in feedback loops it essentially will take things more and more out of our hand and there lies the urgency and let me emphasize that urg- urgency it can never be over emphasized in our intensity to intervene now it's in this context of a uh, you know intensifying impacts and the urgency that one needs to locate both the formal negotiation process and shifts in energy they can't look they can't be viewed just by themselves you know one need to as one to say is the response adequate to the complexity and urgency of the problem essentially and this line i have slightly plucked out one line in a chapter that makes other argument but it's a very striking line it seemed to me where it just shows the lack of d- obligation in the paris agreement that they are not obliged to actually cut emissions so this line by uh, lavanya rajamani again in navaroz's book the second part is the paris agreement seeks to try to limit warming to 1.5 degrees that's all thing gone because of a lag in warming and the lag is due to the fact that a lot of the heat trapped by greenhouse gases goes into the oceans and that's going to surface sooner or later there are other reasons but this is the main one what it implies is that there is a further 0.6 degrees of warming at least there could be more over and above our current 1.1 so that's 1.7 degrees all right and there could be more we know that because of the disaggregated pledges you know uh in the paris agreement 100 and whatever 70 odd countries have made each of them made their own pledges etc etc and even if you collate them together we are talking of 3 degrees of warming which this planet has not seen for millions of years i mean we have no idea what 3 degrees of warming actually average warming and 3 degrees of average warming means 6 degrees in the arctic right my point is the failure is not again an incidental one it's a structural one the entire process of the last 25 or 30 years is structurally unable to deal with the drivers that i had mentioned earlier right and which is why emissions carbon dioxide emissions have risen by 60% since uh, 95 since the first cop was held in berlin over 24 cops year after year after year carbon dioxide emissions have gone have risen by 60% and this failure is and i'm essentially is a failure is giving rise to a lot of responses but it's also giving rise to measures that we should be really careful about because these are processes over which we have very little control and people have more and more talking of ejecting sulfur particles into the atmosphere to actually dim the sun i mean that is uh, to be polite what is ludicrous it's probably worse right there's also other processes that may be less ludicrous but again are potentially dangerous like this which is sort of bccs <laughs> which is in a number of reports and this has many many implications but also has implications on the amount of land it will take over and amount of water that it will use that could more safely and equitably be used elsewhere now my image i have is this when i'm talking about energy transition or a, or a reduction in co2 emissions it's not like a car reversing 
you know it's like a very very large tanker at sea and tankers at sea change track not like that they change track like that so if that happens at all it's going to be a slow process it will, it will happen a transition will happen but it's going to be a basically a slow process essentially now there's been a lot of attention about solar and wind and quite rightly so because there's been a huge expansion in investment in the last few years however there has been a decline in the price of solar and in wind both worldwide these numbers are for india uh and both that has resulted in a huge expansion in capacity i'm underlining capacity because there's a difference between capacity and actual generation of electricity and mind you here i'm talking only the electricity sector if you're talking about emissions overall and we're talking of energy use and there's also other sectors which i'll come to but even within electricity so india's capacity i think is about roughly 22% Uh, currently but its actual generation from renewables is only 8% and that's roughly also the figures worldwide notwithstanding i'm not withstanding the impressive expansion that has taken place both in india and worldwide however these are certain limitations that i need to understand and as a consequence of the massive rise particularly in china but also other places of fossil fuels and coal in particular fossil fuel share in primary energy actually rose from 63 to 68% i'm talking now only of electricity mind you Now, if one considers other sectors, let's say transport, which is again one key sector which need to change and have more public transport, but actually electric vehicles, which are you know get a lot of attention, quite rightly so, and particularly the Tesla, uh, are only 0.4 percent worldwide. If you look at the largest car markets, electric vehicle sales currently are still quite low, 2.2 percent, 1.2 percent in some of the key markets. In other sectors, the shift has been infinitesimal. In industry, it requires intense heat. for some of the industrial processes but it's very difficult to get that from renewable energy homes and buildings is actually an expansion of cooling and particularly in delhi where the rise in upper middle class has meant or middle class upper middle class has meant an expansion in cooling because of the use of acs and even in agriculture and agriculture emits all three uh, ghgs right and it's it's its contribution to uh, uh, overall is still quite large 6 billion tons and clearly there needs a shift in agriculture itself So my point overall is that undoubtedly yes a transition may be happening but I would look at it more as an expansion of renewables and a transition that's maybe at best happening slowly if one looks at what's happening in all the sectors as a consequence the coal oil and gas is still extremely huge we talk okay, this is current demand and essentially what it argues is that the current expansion is significantly more than it was a few years ago both for coal oil and gas My point is that if we want carbon emissions to fall it's not sufficient for renewables to expand you need to have an absolute cut in fossil fuels and that has not happened as yet oil and gas are at the highest worldwide in 2018 than they have ever been and coal is still significant and this is what the data says for the next 20 years now it's possible that an expansion in renewables might shift these numbers slightly but what this available data currently tells us that there's going to be a huge expansion in gas particularly the expansion of shale gas and so on a rise in oil as particularly as cars and so on expand and while coal might flatten out or even decline slightly uh it's still pretty huge and it's still a lot more than it was let's say a decade ago so what does that do for emissions what does that do for the future of emissions particularly of carbon dioxide and methane is this so my this is some slightly subjective but my sense is that carbon dioxide emissions will essentially flatten out in some years and rise slightly in some years this year undoubtedly it's quite likely it will flatten out or decline because of a generalized economic crisis that's persisting however one should remember that the only year in which carbon dioxide emissions fell actually fell in any slightly significant way was in 2009 and that's because of the economic crisis in 2008 where there was about a 370 million tons of decline but in every other year it's been rising significantly and if one does if one considers methane as well because of the us shale gas and so on and because gas is seen as a bridge fuel between the current fossil fuel use and a renewable future and because there's been an expansion in liquefied natural gas where you can actually freeze it cool it make it into liquid put it in tankers or put it in ships and then ship it to where you want it and incidentally china is now importing a lot of lng from the us uh because of that methane emissions are going to essentially significantly rise I would suggest we keep an eye on China. There's no doubt it's slowing. The Chinese government claims their growth rate is six percent. I don't think it's that high. But even if it's four or five percent, let's remember that it's from a much much larger base than it used to be. In 2011, the Chinese economy was six trillion dollars. Today it's 14.14 trillion dollars, according to the IMF. And so even if it's four or five percent, 
that in in absolute terms the amount of resources the amount of materials that they consume is actually higher than it did a decade ago even at a lower growth rate and it's still consuming 23% of the world's primary energy and this is the coal capacity 235 gigawatts of coal capacity is under construction it still uses half the world's concrete and half the world's coal and also let's remember what they're doing in the bri with they essentially using possibly the huge surplus that they had and particularly the bonds uh, us treasury bonds which are like literally literally like one over 1 trillion dollars and some of that is being pumped in in various countries again i don't want to go into what whether those countries need those development <coughs> projects are they good are they bad those are specific and empirical issues for each country but overall what it means because of china's structure of the chinese economy and because of the kind of projects that they are introducing and, and mind you it is not like cuba sending doctors it is essentially an expression of chinese soft power and not so soft power essentially speaking the nature of those projects are high intensive high energy intensive high infrastructure projects dams cement factories in 50 countries uh now finally what would change the trajectories both of emissions energy etc is of course one essentially is moment and i'm going to end with this particular section there's no doubt that the uh uh movement overall uh, is growing uh uh one this this sub chapter like given a tipping point is actually from a college prof in delhi university who he was arguing that the movement is actually crossed a tipping point uh i'll touch upon a couple of countries here uh, we've got yan from xr in friday so for future in the audience and he could probably tell us about uh, xr and so on uh in the us and out in ironically while we've had uh, trump and we've had uh, a range of deeply conservative politics both for climate and politics in general in the us there has also been a fairly encouraging expansion of a certain variety of for want to be better word possibly socialist politics in the us undoubtedly in the last few months reflected in both candidates winning uh, in recent months and also reflected in varieties of the green new deal that have come up from different people in europe uh, as we all know about xr and greta and so on and even though i am slightly wary of too much attention being focusing on one individual there's no doubt that greta thunberg in the last one year has catalyzed and uh, inspired a range of pretty young people she her name is something that comes up often in xr and other younger people here quite often but this the protests that are taking place in england whether there, there are thousands of people uh, on the streets quite regularly uh, has already had a reflection in politics and if you notice in recent months in varied elections in different countries the green party in different countries uh, is doing a lot better more candidates greater vote share etc etc let's not assume that the green politics is necessarily progressive you could also have a conservative green politics however again there there certainly changes that are happening that are pretty significant what about india i'll briefly touch upon india uh, i should underline that the social and political context here is very very different from england or for a range of reasons that that you will understand more uh, but about movements here for years i would i was hesitant about calling what was happening here a climate movement i would sort of saying uh, we have no climate movement the question is now do we finally have a climate movement undoubtedly simply from conversations that i've had with a very wide range of people the number of times i've been called for talks and so on and a lot lot others there's a far far wider engagement happening now particularly among younger people but also among others also among activists also among older people who sort of realize that yeah climate change and climate the climate crisis is seriously something that we need to consider engage with incorporate find out more about figure out what's going on etc again like i said yan is here you can talk about xr on friday future but briefly i think it's too early to be critical of maybe what xr and whatsapp uh, xr and fff are doing broadly though they are a whatsapp generation and there are both the limitations and the pluses of that in a lot of places they have been able to actually um, bring together people very quickly the last time when uh, a few weeks ago when a strike took place i believe there were xr protests taking place in 65 towns in india 65 and this was unthinkable even one year ago and activist friends of mine in different towns are quite intrigued and puzzled and they saying we need to learn how are these people able to sort of mobilize themselves how are they suddenly coming out it's really actually quite interesting striking both also the social forms the technology the modes all of which has a bearing uh, 
on how they are able to mobilize and for their politics. Though, uh, is the necessity of these movements engaging with older struggles, engaging with inequalities and structural inequalities, I think that might well happen. Like I said, it's too early to comment critically on them. It's they're barely a few, in some cases a few weeks, in some cases a few months old. So one is yet to see how they might move forward, but that engagement is essential. Both the farmers in the trade union movement, and I hope that their representatives come here later today, face such grave, and particularly about jobs and the agrarian crisis, that it becomes difficult for them perhaps to engage in the depth as necessary, but it's something that is unavoidable. Uh, new social movements perhaps are, but again, I, I find with all these movements is that I think the engagement tends to be more or less, except perhaps very few exceptions, tend to be among the leadership and not so much among the mass base. And that to me is essential if we need to actually move forward. And I think that finally, uh, I think the ecological concerns that are deepening in different ways, whether because of pollution, whether because of climate change and so on, I think would help uh, a resurgence of the left. Uh, going forward to conclude briefly, I would say this. So these to me are sort of three known unknowns. They may be unknown unknowns. These are known unknowns. And in that, the first and the third are pretty um, evident to you. The second is that the, the oceans and the land, the forests and so on, have been helping us in the last 50 years by absorbing more carbon dioxide as we keep pumping more, in contrast to what it was doing earlier. How, how long that might carry on, one, don't, one doesn't know. But I know this much, that there won't be a fast transition. That's for sure. Like I said, it's like a very large tanker. But this is desperately needed, a left resurgence. We are all weak. It doesn't matter what party you're from or whether you're not from a party, if you're from the left. A broad left resurgence is needed for us all, whether it's in the climate crisis or whether it's about other questions of politics. Otherwise, it's just going to be taken over by large companies and by the right. And I'm afraid that at the moment seems the more likely scenario. And finally, what has to be done is to sort of touch upon this, which is that awareness building is not There's a lot of awareness building going on. People calling, want to know what's going on. That's not With that luxury of let's find out and then let's do, that's gone. That time is gone. And we need to talk of, we don't usually talk about reducing emissions in Indian context because of Indian developmental needs, but because of the deep inequality persisting in India, I don't think one can say that overall. And there needs to be a talk of how one can reduce emissions in urban areas and that different ways are being talked about. There's a prof in JNU who's talked about a progressive carbon tax for India. There could be a lot else that one could talk about. But a key question for us is in a, decline, in a deeply declining job market, and particularly for women, I might add that 49 million women have stepped out of the labor market or lost jobs since 2004. How can one engage in the climate crisis and at the same time talk about increasing jobs? What is it possible? Is it possible with solar and wind, etc.? And that to me is pretty much the last one. But uh, so right to develop cannot, in a sense have the luxury of simply tinkering with our current, tinkering with our current development tree. And it's not just a protection of various ecosystems, but also a revival.